ship at the top of the frame disappears and appears again almost simultaneously, just above the slope of the hill. When the film is examined, the beam ship disappears and appears in the same frame, which means that less than one eighteenth of a second has elapsed. In order to complete their background research, the elders visit Scotland to talk with John McVeigh, a member of the Royal Society of Astronomers, and a published authority on the structure of the universe and the possibility of interstellar travel. Is it possible to travel from the Pleiades to this planet? I think the only way I, any intelligent beings and living beings could possibly reach here the entrance of the sun from the uh, my Pleiades uh, would be by some unconventional means probably by hyperspace. One can use this term now a bit more freely because uh, it has kind of scientific um, mm. significance now. Mm -hmm. You know, this McVeigh is quite an impressive guy. He's written six books on related subject matter, life in outer space, interstellar travel. I think uh, he knows uh, quite a bit of what he's talking about, I see. Yeah, I've got one question I'd like to ask him, though. What's that? I want to see if he's got any information on this historical connection we keep coming up with. Mm -hmm. Because we found it everywhere from the Incas to the Aztecs to the Greeks to the Romans to <laughs> Egypt, everywhere. Possibly he's come across something in his research. Well, the Pleiades are very well known. In fact, they're a very ancient group. They're, they're mentioned, in fact, in the Bible, in the book of Job. I can't just give you chapters and verse, but they are, they are a very old uh, group. And they've been used by many ancient civilizations to signify the approach of, of autumn, winter. Hippocrates recorded that summer begins with their rising and winter with their setting. And Greek temples are aligned to these events. The great pyramids of Egypt are also aligned to the Pleiades. To some African nations, they are known as the Seven Goddesses. In China, they are called the Seven Maidens, and they are the Seven Beneficent Spirits of the Hindu Vedas. Curiously, in all these separate cultures, they are always referred to in the female. The Pleiadians told Maya they used females for their first contacts because they appeared less aggressive to early man. The Mayans celebrated the moment when the Pleiades reached their zenith as the most important event in their calendar. Pre-Incan peoples believed their gods came down from the Pleiades. And on the mysterious plains of Nazca, Peru, the Thunderbird marks the plaza of the Pleiades. In other cultures, the cluster is regarded as the place of God's house, the center of heaven. The law of American Indian tribes is full of the Pleiades, which, according to some, stand at the gates of heaven. Historian John M. Hula, a Kiowa Indian, relates one story that survives to this day. It is tied to Devil's Tower in Wyoming. This mountain here, Kiowas lived in this area, and we call it the Old Tie, Old Tie. Kiowas camped through here, winter camp. And these children were playing. They were playing and they were running along this ledge over here. A giant bear came out of the woods and chased these children. The seven children, seven, seven sisters, we call them. And they came to this one ledge here. And the children got on top of it. This ledge began to grow. It grew out of the ground. As the mountain grew, the bear's claws were scratched in the mountain. And that's what the, we see today is the grooves up there. And from there, the seven sisters went on up into the sky. And they're up there today. The Pleiadians today, they wasn't created and born on the Pleiadian planets. 
they came out of the planets of the system Lyra and Vega. But two, they was not created there because their forebears came from some other planets and other uh, galaxy somewhere into space. Those space travelers who were the ancestors of Earth races came from star systems differing from yours in many respects. When these ancestors came to your planet too, there were already humans developing here. Since in the universe there exist many different colored peoples, races developed here that were able to adapt to the conditions in different parts of Earth. We can see also we not are the baddest races in the universe. How many sects go to tell and to say that the most bad thing what's happened over all the universe shall be the human being on earth. It isn't true. There is trouble here and there is trouble somewhere else into the space on other planets too. There remain only a few questions to clear up, but one of them has perhaps the most bearing on the Maya case. If his story is true, how did those beings accomplish a journey of such staggering distances? The investigators put the question to Alan Holt, an astrophysicist who works with the U.S. space program, and David Froning, a specialist in spacecraft design for that program. Gentlemen, is faster than light travel possible today? In our technology, or is this still just theory? There have been physicists that are, have been so bold and brave as to actually postulate the existence of particles that travel faster than the speed of light. And they have called these entities tachyons. And they have shown that uh, the existence of such faster than light entities may not violate uh, known laws of physics. I've worked on a kind of a field theory approach, uh, which is basically uh, uh, an extension. I like, we like to view it as an extension of Einstein's uh, last work on a unified field theory. I, I really think that everything is pointing to a breakthrough uh, that will make possible faster than light travel. Now, not, not all physicists will agree with that. How would it work? Well, I've represented uh, here. Uh, hyperspace currents by these blue and, and red lines. Down in here would be space and time. So space and time is what we're aware of and what, what, what we deal with in everyday life. But there could exist a higher dimensional space, a hyperspace, that we can interact with uh, by certain configurations of electromagnetic energy patterns. So the, the concept here would be you start out with a certain pattern uh, generally you're tied in with the Earth's gravitational field and its hyperspace currents, but there's a, pos a low uh, connection with perhaps a distant star. As you change the pattern, the connection with the Earth's gravitational field and its hyperspace currents decreases, and the connection with the distant star's pattern increases. And so in effect, you're being pushed away from the Earth's gravitational field and pulled in to a gravitational field of a distant star. I had some artists uh, do some work here showing a spacecraft leaving our solar system and going out of space and time. This red line represents the division between space and time and hyperspace. And the spacecraft, uh, based on the propulsion concept I proposed, uh, would use a field resonance effect to effectively jump into hyperspace, disappearing from space and time in our solar system, and then reappearing at a at a distant star. And Mr. Froding, you showed me a diagram that you had worked up that's very similar to this, that uh, describes a uh, hyperspace leap in some fashion also. It's remarkable how similar they are. Well, what I've tried to symbolize by this diagram is, first of all, the familiar space-time plane of existence shown here in blue of our physical world. At the journey's start, some distance is traveled and some time taken getting out of the solar system as shown by the curved line at the left. Then a hyperspace jump covers most of the distance with almost no lapse of time. Some time is taken again decelerating to the target, the curved line on the right. <laughs> 